So Peter Crane, it's a delight to have you on this interview. It was wonderful to be with you at Oak Spring in Virginia. And you have had such a distinguished career, head of the Kew Botanical Gardens, at the, and as well at the Field Museum in Chicago, leading their science team and so on. And then coming here to Yale um, to be our dean at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, and then continuing with us was marvelous at this conference in October of 2018. So I'd like to just begin by um, asking you to tell us a little bit more about Oak Spring, why this place is so very special, the Mellon Estate, and why it was such a great setting for our conference there on the Living Earth Community. Thanks, Mary Evelyn. It's great to have a chance to talk to you. Well, uh, uh, you know, Oak Spring uh, was really the home of um, Paul and Bunny Mellon, two of the great uh, American philanthropists of the late 20th century. And we now have the privilege of managing their home and garden and wonderful library to bring people together for the kinds of conversations that we had during the Living Earth meeting. And uh, those meetings can be quite small, quite, quite intimate. The setting is, is peaceful, delightful, and a wonderful uh, landscape. So it's a great opportunity for people to get together, to get to know each other, and to have some meaningful com conversations sort of separated from all of the kind of clutter uh, that we have in our, our daily lives. So uh, yeah. we're we were just thrilled to host the meeting. And... Um, that's one of the things that we do is to uh, create these spaces for these conversations. Yeah, and you might just want to say something about the Botanical Library collection there that we all were in awe of. <laughs> I think, you know, really I say there are kind of two jewels at, uh, at Oak Spring, uh, in addition to the broader, wonderful uh, rural landscape. Um, but um, uh, there are two jewels. One is the garden itself, which was so lovingly cared for by Mrs. Mellon over. 50 years and influenced so many um, uh, other gardens, including the gardens at the White House. Um, but the other is the magnificent collection of books and manuscripts that she accumulated over the course of her lifetime that relate to plants, gardens, uh, and landscapes. So it's just full of, full of treasures um, that kind of illuminate the world of plants uh, and their influence uh, over the last um, half millennium or so. Yes. Well, that's what was so inspiring, of course, to see this both outside and inside in the book collection. Uh, and the curating goes on clearly, which is why the topic that we were exploring together, this living earth community, um, we'd love to get your take on it, both what your feel is for that phrase, both scientifically, maybe through humanities, um, and uh, what you were hearing through the participants at the conference about living earth community. Well, uh, from, from my point of view, uh, this phrase, the living earth community, it's both, it's both a, a metaphor, but also a kind of scientific uh, reality uh, in the sense that, um, you know, any uh, biologist, ecologist understands that the world, the, the, the animate world, the biological world, is connected to uh, the broader Earth system in many complicated ways. And we understand and we are understanding more about those ways all the time. But it would be uh, tremendously hubristic of us to assume that we understand the whole thing. Uh, so we, from a scientific point of view, are understanding the whole Earth system. But I think... Um, you know, we're also trying to grapple with our place, the human place uh, in that system, and how we think about our relationship to, to that system. And for me, that's what this conference was all about, how we as humans, uh, with our place in evolution and our place uh, in ecology, think about uh, the world around us and its, and its complexity and how we relate to it and the many different ways in which we relate to the living world. So this idea, as we know, is both new and old. There's indigenous uh, resonance there with native peoples and so on. Um, and there, was, there were many new takes on it as well. So could you just comment on this both new and old uh, regarding a living earth community, our understanding of it? 
Well, of course, people have been thinking about this topic since the beginning of time. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that, uh, that you see at Oak Spring with no light pollution is you see the magnificent sky above you and it starts to kind of put you um, in your place. And, um, but I think, so, so people have been thinking about our relationship to the natural world, to the cosmos for a very long time. But I think there's a kind of a, a, a resurgence at the moment um, that takes, that's taking our kind of understanding of our, our place in the world beyond just the kind of mechanistic biological side to broader concepts of, uh, of, of humanity and the way we think about uh, the world. And so with ideas are coming in, there's a kind of fusion of ideas from religion, from history, uh, from anthropology, from many different areas that are coming together, I think. Because I think um, we realize that science by itself is not always enough. And uh, there's more to understand, uh, particularly if you want to motivate people and to get people excited about these issues. There's more to this than, than just the science. Yeah, maybe we can pick that up, Peter, thank you. Uh, this notion of multiple ways of being and of knowing uh, in the world, that was our subtitle. And clearly, there's a sensibility that's emerging more and more um, that science gives us great knowledge and data and understanding and, um, and sometimes the mechanistic understanding of how plants work or trees and so on. But there seems to be this press pressing in on our sensibilities, um, a, a broader, deeper ecological sense. And so maybe you could just, um, I mean, even when you, you are studying plants, um, the livingness must be so apparent to you all the time. It's almost obvious. But anyway, if you could just comment on this, both the need for multiple ways of knowing, and then how does livingness in plants, for example, come forward in your studies? So, uh, yeah, I think it's a little difficult uh, for me to kind of, um, to articulate uh, exactly, um, you know, how I think about it. I mean, obviously I'm a scientist and I view the world very much through a scientific uh, lens. There are specific things that we can understand, that we can conduct experiments on, that we can document and so on. But the other side of that is having the humility to recognize that there are many things that we don't understand and perhaps we'll never understand uh, from a kind of mechanistic point of view. And there's a kind of deeper question of how we relate to the world around us and how we should relate to the world around us, which takes us into uh, other areas, non-scientific areas, takes us into philosophical uh, areas. It takes us into the questions of religion and it puts us in a, in a place that sees... Um, that sees our existence, our short, personal, very short, temporary existence in this world into a broader uh, a context, a broader context of geological time, a broader context of human history. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it, it really the conversation for me was about exploring how we can go beyond science to really understand our place in the world and to think about how we should relate to the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you uh, for that, Peter. Um, just picking up again the thread of your own studies and reflections on this, you're a paleobotanist. Uh, you, do un you understand what we like to call deep time, evolutionary time. Uh, you studied the ginkgo, a 200 million year old extraordinary species. So, Again, give us a, a feel for when you're in the field, perhaps, um, and uh, what is this, what is the sense of discovering fossils of deep time, uh, and maybe uh, bring in something of the ginkgo that, that you wrote this magnificent book on. Um, so paleobotany, give us a feel. So, uh, you know, I think uh, um, 
anyone who's thoughtful about the natural world will understand that it, it can't be just understood here in the moment. Uh, it can only really be understood in the context of its, of its broader history. And uh, for me, that, that's um, you know, tr tremendously uh, kind of empowering and a tremendously important uh, perspective, because again, it put, starts to put us in, into a more sensible uh, context. So, um, you know, uh, the ginkgo story was, was, was very, very interesting, but it kind of started uh, a queue contemplating one of the great trees there, one of the oldest ginkgos in Europe, that was planted in the mid 18th century. So when one stops to reflect and consider the, the changes that that tree, that single living organism has lived through, uh, then you start to realize that you are just another moment uh, in the life of, of this other uh, organism. And uh, uh, so, the, ind the lives of individual trees, I mean, I was discussing with my son last night that some of the trees uh, around our home here in Chicago that are perhaps a couple of hundred years old were certainly alive before uh, many uh, European immigrants were in this part of uh, North America. So it gives you a sense of time. And then as a paleontologist, that sense of time is extended dramatically further back into a time scale that's not just now a few hundreds of years, which is daunting enough, or even a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of years, but is of a few million years, or even a few tens of million years, or even a few hundreds of millions of years. And that, I think, should give us all a kind of moment to stop and think about how our species and then how we as individuals fit together into this broader context and the way we should think about this earth. The earth was here long before we were here as a species, long before we were here as individual human beings. And uh, that for me is an important point of reference, an important touchstone as we kind of think about uh, our relationship to the natural world. And I think from that deeper understanding, um, rather than perhaps from a specific mechanistic scientific understanding of some particular problem that we're having to grapple with, such as climate change, from that deeper understanding should come and could come the motivation for a different kind of relationship with each other and with the natural world. So that's kind of where uh, I'm coming from. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing for us to uh, uh, understand, but I think that we, we, it's very clear that science by itself is not enough. And uh, if you uh, reflect just for a moment on the climate change uh, issue, you realize that even with all the science, the best science uh, in the world, um, uh, that's still not enough to get people motivated to take action. So there's, there's a need for something deeper. Surely part of that's economic, part of that is a political, but part of that is motivational, part of that is kind of spiritual in a sense about how individuals think about their place in the world, which I think at the end of the day means that it's no longer all about us, but that it's about a much broader way of thinking about the world. It's so uh, beautifully said, Peter, thank you. And it, it strikes me um, that we're all actually coming into a period of human consciousness, you might say, that's beginning to absorb what you as a paleobotanist take for granted or people who study evolutionary biology and so on. But I think um, what you're saying is that depth of time increases our awe, our sense of wonder, our, our feel for complexity and how, how this emerges over time, this 200 million year old ginkgo, for example. Um, and uh, the, the ginkgo itself has this remarkable 
um, moment, right, when it loses its leaves, which you've told us about. And just give us a feel for the ginkgo and that process and what it's doing, this, this ancient, ancient species that's uh, living in cities, living uh, in so many areas of the world still. Um, but give us a little more of a feeling of the ginkgo and what drew you to it. Well, um, what drew me to the ginkgo was really that, it, that it's just a wonderful evolutionary and cultural uh, story. I call it an evolutionary and cultural uh, biography. It's a, a life story of a lineage um, uh, that, I, that I think, um, you know, has a lot to teach us because it, it puts these time scales uh, before us uh, in ways that, that we can relate to because of our familiarity and relationship to this uh, uh, individual tree. And, um, you know, in the fall, uh, well, ginkgo on the whole is not the world's most spectacular tree. I mean, it has beautiful leaves, but in the fall, it can be uh, absolutely uh, gorgeous as those leaves turn uh, brimstone yellow, as someone once described it, and before they all fall with this kind of eerie uh, synchronicity that, that they have. But I think, um, you know, you used a few words a moment ago, Mary Evelyn, uh, to, to sort of describe our, uh, the way we think about the history of life. One word that always comes back to me and that relates to, you know, when you look at that ginkgo in the fall is a word that Darwin used at the end of Origin of Species, grandeur. There is grandeur in this view of life, a view of life that just doesn't focus on what we're hardwired to do, which is to think about our own survival and our own uh, existence, but that, that expands that to think more broadly about the living world and how it came to be and where we sit in these broader historical patterns of which we are just uh, a tiny part as individuals, but where we as a human species are now a kind of dominant, geologically significant force. So that, um, you know, how we, how we reconcile these things, I think is really um, what the conference was about, how we, uh, how, how we know the world, which to me is about how we think about our place in the world. But that, that was what was central. And there were some wonderful writers, thinkers, scientists there who helped us explore that, that topic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, just to conclude uh, with our, our deepest gratitude, Peter, um, because, you know, what you're saying, of course, is why we did Journey of the Universe to help us understand this geological time, this cosmological time, and bringing it out here at Yale with you was a very special uh, experience. And maybe we can just conclude with um, a description of a rather extraordinary, um, I guess you'd say model that you've developed of this 80 million year old flower and its opening, which gives people a feeling for exactly what you're talking about. Um, deep time, complexity, beauty, um, and uh, dare we even say reverence for life, of uh, the grandeur of life. So maybe you could um, help us to understand how you put that together, this uh, replication of, uh, of an 80 million year old fossil <laughs> flower opening? Well, I think, um, you know, that's kind of part of a bigger story. Uh, you know, um, I think, um, you know, over the, uh, whatever it is, 150 or more years since Darwin's uh, origin of species, uh, we've, we've understood a lot about the kind of processes of uh, uh, evolution how evolution works on relatively small time scales, but what's important too is to understand evolution on large time scales. And that has really kind of come to the fore over the last, um, let's say, uh, uh, 30 years. And there really um, have been, I think, kind of two main sort of fronts uh, in this. One has been uh, the development of uh, the techniques of molecular biology to understand the DNA of living species and how living species interrelate to each other, and particularly what the evolutionary pattern looks like, what the evolutionary tree looks like, 
which was something that as a student, you know, we could never have contemplated we would know. <laughs> and then the other side of it is the remarkable advances that have been made uh, in paleontology and uh, invertebrate paleontology, invertebrate paleontology, the kind of fresh thinking that, uh, that has developed in paleo paleontology generally, I would say, uh, again, over the last 30, 40 uh, years, um, you know, have brought new insights themselves. These ideas of, of mass extinctions, uh, uh, for example, that my former colleagues, Dave Ralph and Jack Sepkowski at University of Chicago were so uh, engaged with. Um, but also from a paleontological point of view, technology has helped us as well to get more out of the fossils that we have. And particularly important have been uh, the new imaging techniques that have been developed. So the idea that you can that you can take an 80 million year old flower bud, which is just a couple of millimeters tall, and you can make thousands of X-ray slices through that flower and reconstruct it in three dimensions, so it can be dissected, so that you can animate in a way that flower and get a level of detail that again would have been unimaginable um, 50 years ago. You know, these, these things, the molecular side and the imaging side and paleontology are also contributing in a very scientific and sort of mechanistic way to our understanding of deep time. But at the same time, they are kind of illuminating this bigger picture, uh, which is so important much more broadly uh, to kind of understand the way we should be thinking about our, our place uh, in the world. And yeah. um, uh, I think there's more and more uh, uh, interest in how uh, paleontology can be relevant to our understandings today. And one of the ways is to appreciate the nature of changes through time uh, on the planet, and that connects very easily and very rapidly to the kinds of ideas that we were talking about. How, how do we think about our place uh, in the world? What do we take away from a uh, deeper understanding of kind of evolutionary history? Peter, thank you so much. Uh, this was just terrific in every way. And we um, look forward to continuing the conversation with you over deep time. Thank you so much, Peter.